Stand therefore, having shod your feet, now listen to this, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Say it with me, the gospel of peace. The New Living Translation renders this verse, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. The word peace, believe it or not, occurs over 400 times in the Bible. And basically, there are two kinds of peace that the Bible describes. First of all, there's what we might call peace with God. And secondly, what the Bible refers to as the peace of God. Now, let's talk about the first one. The Bible teaches that when you try to live your life outside of a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, you can never achieve a deep peace in your life. Everyone is aware of this cosmic discomfort to some degree. But when we come to Jesus Christ and put our trust in him, here's what the Bible says about us. Listen to this. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What that means is when we become a Christian, the hostility between God and us goes away. You say, well, I'm not hostile to God. Well, I hate to tell you this, but God's hostile to you because of your rebellion against him and his plan for your life. And when you come and submit yourself to God and you accept his plan for your life, especially a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ, the hostility, the barrier, the closed fist that we often have toward God ends up going away. And all of a sudden, that feeling of being at odds with God is, is evaporated. And now you know you're not at odds with God, you're in fellowship with God. That's what we know. But here's what we need to know. There's peace with God, and then there's the peace of God. On more than one occasion, Jesus told his disciples that there's a peace available to them and to us that is capable of calming their hearts no matter what's going on in their life, no matter what the storm might be. Let me just give you two of those promises. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And later on in the same book, he said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You know, I, I know that a lot of us, uh, we do this. When, when trouble comes, do you ever pray this prayer? Lord, please make this go away. <laughs> please make this go away. Or Lord, I don't know what to do about this problem. Would you just resolve this because I don't know what to do? I've been praying that prayer for well over 50 years, and I'm going to tell you what my score is. It's 50 to zero. God does not do that. God allows these problems in our lives, and then he orchestrates the circumstances so that he can show us his strength in the midst of it. God's purpose in your life and in mine is not to make all our trouble go away, but to show us that in the midst of our trouble and in the midst of our stress and in the midst of our anxiety, he is enough. Amen. And when we find that out, we are so rich, we can get up every day with confidence. Amen? So we can say, I don't know what's going to happen today, but here's what I know. My God is enough. Yeah. And I fall in love with this little song by Joe D. Messina called My God is Bigger Than This. And uh, every time I think of something in my life that's challenging, I just sing that little song. My God is bigger than this. And he is. But let me ask you a question. How do you find that out unless you have trouble in your life? God allows trouble in our lives to show us how strong he is in the midst of it all. So here we are, all of us, probably somewhere along the continuum, and we know that we're living a life of anxiety that is not the life God wants us to live. So I want to give you some strategies today for peace to place in your heart where anxiety now resides. I'm going to ask you five questions. I'm going to use the five interrogatives that journalists always use. How, what, who, where, and when. And each of these is a strategy that you should mark down in your heart. Number one, here's the question. How are you praying? There are 
Two passages in the Bible that help us with this particular problem in our lives. One is Philippians 4 and the other is Matthew chapter 6. I would call these the central passages in the Bible on anxiety. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. In this passage, the word anxious literally means to be pulled in two different directions. It means to have an inward war going on inside, a battle going on in your inner spirit, pulling you apart. Someone has said, if it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. And let me tell you what I've learned in my own personal life and from the scripture. When I'm facing stress and turbulence in my life, there are two kinds of prayer that are helpful that often get overlooked in most discussions of prayer. The first one is progressive prayer, and the second is proactive prayer. So let's take them one at a time. What is progressive prayer? Well, let me just say, when we're under pressure, what do we do? We run to the Lord, we rush into his presence, and we dump our list of stuff on him without even saying hello. (laughs) We say, God, I need this, 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 and this, and I need it now and tomorrow and the next day, and if you could get ahead of time, that would be great. It would even be better. (laughs) But real prayer is a lifestyle of love for God and rushing into his presence with our laundry list of needs without pausing to truly focus on him can depress us more than if we hadn't ever prayed at all. Because if we talk to God and all we talk to him about are our problems and we don't see him high and lifted up in our worship, all we're doing is rehearsing our problems and driving them deeper inside and prayer is not a help, it's a hindrance to our issues. I've discovered that when I'm under pressure, it's easy for me to skip right to my issues and forget about the God to whom I am praying. But when I pray and I worship God, here's what happens. God grows in my life until my problems are put into perspective. If I only give God my problems, all I got is me and my problems. But when I go to God first, I've got my problems, I've got God, and I've got me. That's the first thing. Number two, I like to call this proactive prayer. We usually treat prayer as remedial. By that I mean we pray when we have a need. We pray when we're in trouble. We pray when we find ourselves in a spot we don't know what to do. We're so desperate. How many times people have said to me, Dr. Jeremiah, I've tried everything. All I got left is prayer. (laughs) And I often say, well, why would you put prayer at the bottom of the list when it should be at the top of the list? I mean, why don't you go there first? But we don't do that often, do we? Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 18, 1. He said, we ought always to pray and not lose heart. He didn't say, we ought always to pray after we lose heart. He said, we ought always to pray and not lose heart. So every day we should start and kind of look over the day and say, Lord God, I'm going to be here today and here today and here today. And I pray for your strength to be the person of God I should be. Help me to bring the influence of Jesus into this situation. Or I'm headed to the doctor today. Lord, I don't know what the news is going to be, but I know you're sufficient and I pray for strength. You pray proactively. Don't pray after it happens. Pray before it happens. Amen? All right. So now we got this prayer thing done. All right. How are you praying? That's the first thing. Number two, what are you thinking? In Philippians 4, Paul wrote, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That's in the same passage where you find the instruction about prayer. Now, with this list, Paul is telling us exactly and specifically what we're to think on, making it clear that we get to direct our thoughts. Or you say, Pastor, I can't direct my thoughts. They just pop into my head. (laughs) Well, the Bible wouldn't tell us to direct our thoughts if it were not possible. Our thought life is supposed to be positive and uplifting and redemptive because our thought life is the launching pad for our outward life. 
if you want your mind to be free of anxiety, make determined, definite choices as to what you allow into it. And I cannot stress this enough. You are the guardian of your mind. And I could give you all kinds of practical illustrations about turn off the television. I, I, I keep looking for a channel where something's worth watching and I haven't found it yet. I mean, in our, in our city, we got like hundreds of channels. I've told my wife more than once, isn't it a pity that we got all these channels and when you want to watch something that's uplifting and positive, you can't find one blessed thing. That's the world we live in. So what does that mean? I'm not going to give you the statistics of how many hours we sit in front of that stupid box, but I'm going to tell you it's too many. Learn the power of shutting off because all that is, it's dragging all the negative stuff of the world right into your house and then right into your mind. And it's pretty hard to overcome that. I mean, the political wars and the political fighting and the nastiness of the political arena on both sides is just so discouraging. You got to get away from that. You got to get away from always stuffing your mind with the ugliness of the world in which you live. And you have to be proactive about getting the right stuff in your mind. It is not going to come by itself. I love Max Lucado. He's a friend of mine. And got one of the freshest pens out there. Here's what he said. You probably know this, but in case you don't, I'm so thrilled to give you the good news. You can pick what you ponder. <laughs> you didn't select your birthplace at birth date. You didn't choose your parents or your siblings. You don't determine the weather or the amount of salt in the ocean. There are many things in life over which you have no choice, but the greatest activity of life is well within your dominion. You can choose what you think about. You can be the air traffic controller of your mental airport. You occupy the control tower. You can direct the mental traffic of your world. Thoughts circle above, coming and going, and if one of them lands, it's because you gave it permission. And if it leaves, it's because you directed it to do so. You can select your thought pattern. Turns out that our most valuable weapon against anxiety weighs less than three pounds and sits between our ears. Think about what you think about. That's a really good word. And I'm here to tell you that God wants your mind to be so saturated with his truth that you learn to see life the way he sees it. He's certainly at peace. I mean, did you ever read in the Gospels where Jesus came and everybody was hungry and he was so filled with anxiety he didn't know what to do? And we're to get into Jesus and let Jesus get into us so we respond to the world the way he did. Learn to rest your thoughts on the Almighty. Here's a great verse that most of us know. Isaiah 26, 3. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. First question, how are you praying? Second question, what are you thinking? Third question, who are you following? To overcome anxiety, you can't just think about what is good you also have to begin to live it out. And often that means you need a mentor or someone that you can depend on to help you. That's why Paul wrote to the Philippian church. He said to them in the same passage in Philippians, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, do these and the God of peace will be with you. Paul's message to the Philippians was this, take the lessons I've taught you Practice the things you've seen me do, and you too will begin to experience the presence of the God of peace. Maybe you're one of those people who's a worrier. Get a friend that you meet for coffee. Join a small group at your church of people you really trust. Pick up and read an encouraging book about someone, maybe even the apostle, who learned how to hand their anxious cares over to the Lord. Let God's peace in their lives influence the anxiety in your life. We learn from others, don't we? Always reading a book. Are you always reading a book? I, I got two books for me right now. I'm, I'm going to get to them before this week is over. <laughs> These books are meant to help me, to encourage me. You're never too old to learn from others how to do life better. Amen. Amen? Amen? So how are you praying? What are you thinking? Who are you following? Here's the fourth one. Where are you living? We've seen how, what, and who. Now it's time to examine where. Where do your thoughts live? 
Where are you living? I'll tell you there's only three possibilities. You're either living in the past, you're living in the future, or you're living in the present. Jesus said, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Think about it. The past exists only as mere memory. The future exists only in the imagination. Only the present exists in true reality. So why do we ruin the only moment of existence we have by pulling trouble from non-existent places like the past and the future? I wrote a book some years ago called Slaying the Giants in Your Life. And I wrote these words in that book. There's a reason God placed us within the moment, bracketed away from both the past and the future, because they are both off limits to us, and we need to post no trespassing signs. The past is closed for good, and the future is under construction, but today has everything you need, so come here and make today your home. Learn to live your life in day-tight compartments. Live your life for today. Here's what happens. When you borrow trouble from the future, now you've got double trouble. <laughs> if you live in the past and you live in the future, you're allowing two thieves to rob your life. But if you live in the present, the Bible says that God is sufficient for every day. There's a wonderful verse in Deuteronomy 33, 25. Here's what it says. As your days so shall your strength be. I love that verse. That means, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen on Wednesday or Thursday. I got this and that and all that. But all I know is this. For this day, I got the strength you want me to have. Amen. As my days, so shall my strength be. I live on that. I mean, I, I've got so much stuff going on in my life right now. If I wanted to sit back and worry, I could be a professional worrier. I could, get, I could get awards, but I chose not to do that. Here's what I've learned. I don't know how God's going to deal with tomorrow, but I know he's sufficient for today. And I'm going to rest in the promise that he has always kept. He's never, ever out-promised himself. So how are you praying? What are you thinking? Who are you following? Where are you living? And finally, when will you find peace? You remember the graphic photo of the napalm girl from the Vietnam War? Remember that? It's a painful picture to see. It's a naked nine-year-old girl running down a dirty street with her arms flapping, face twisted in horror. Other children are running with her, and behind them are billowing clouds of napalm wafting toward them and burning their skin. That girl's name is Kim Phuc Phan Thi. And she was caught in a South Vietnamese bombing raid of a route used by the Viet Cong rebels. And the photographer who took that photo was a guy named Nick Oot, put down his camera, which he had instinctively picked up, and quickly transported that little girl to a hospital and saved her life. Here's the rest of the story. Kim endured decades of physical suffering. For many years, she prayed to the gods her family traditional religion had taught her. She prayed for healing, and no answers came. Her dream was to become a doctor, and she actually began studies in that field, but the world knew her in a different way, and her government forced her to leave school and be available to speak and tour. Devastated and desperate, seeking answers, she went to Saigon's Central Library, and she started pulling Vietnamese books of religion off the shelves, one by one, and the stack in front of her contained a copy of the New Testament. After thumbing through several books, she opened the New Testament and began to read in the Gospels. And she was gripped by the sufferings of Christ as he bore our sins on the cross. Shortly afterward, on a Christmas Eve in 1982, Kim gave her life to Christ at a worship service. The message that day was about the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. She wrote later, How desperately I needed peace. How ready I was for love and joy. I had so much hatred in my heart, so much bitterness. I wanted to let go of all my pain. I wanted to pursue life instead of holding fast to the fantasies of death. I wanted this Jesus. So when the pastor finished speaking, I stood up, stepped into the aisle, made my way to the front of the sanctuary, and I said yes to Jesus Christ. 
And there in a small church in Vietnam, mere miles from the street where my journey had begun amid the chaos of war, on the night before the world would celebrate the birth of the Messiah, I invited Jesus Christ into my heart. When I woke up that Christmas morning, she said, I experienced the kind of healing that can only come from God. I was finally at peace. Many years later, Kim married and immigrated to Canada. She reconnected to the photographer whom she calls Uncle Nick, and they talk every week. Today, Kim's life's purpose is to heal others through the love and peace of Christ. Most remarkably, Kim ultimately forgave everyone who had harmed her. She rose above her physical and emotional scars and made a choice to embrace the hope of salvation through forgiveness. She understood that unless she could forgive, she could not grow closer to Christ or bring others into his fold. So the question is, when will you find peace? When will you make the how, what, who, where of his peace your priorities? Look at how you're praying, what you're thinking, who you're following, where your thoughts are living. When you embrace these steps, let the Lord fill your overcomer's heart with his peace. Here's the verse that is my prayer as we close this session. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 Every week when I stand here in front of an empty auditorium and preach to more people than I ever have before in my life, I'm reminded of the incredible opportunity that God has given me to share the wonderful message of the gospel with those who watch and listen. And I just want to let you know the one thing that's burning in my heart more than anything else is that if you are watching and you do not know Jesus Christ in a personal way, before we're finished uh, with our service, you will accept him and allow him to fill you with his presence and his guidance and his friendship and his salvation during this time. I wanna talk with you in this message about the perfect storm. When the Andrea Gale left Gloucester Harbor in Massachusetts on September the 20th, 1991, and headed into the North Atlantic, no one could have known that this fishing boat would never be seen again. Only a bit of debris ever turned up and the six crew members vanished forever. In his book, The Perfect Storm, author Sebastian Junger immortalized the fate of the Andrea Gale. A film followed featuring George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg, but these stars, big as they are, played only supporting roles. The real star of the film was the storm itself, a terrifying, relentless oppressor born of fierce winds and mountainous waves. It was meteorologists who named this cataclysmic tempest the perfect storm. It is just a way of saying worst case scenario. In the case of the Andrea Gale, it was the simultaneous convergence of the toughest weather conditions possible. Three deadly elements came together in October of 1991. First of all, there was a front moving from Canada toward New England and a high pressure system building over Canada's east coast and the dying remnants of Hurricane Grace, all of them churning along the eastern seaboard of the United States. Strong weather was coming from three of the four points on the compass and all of it converging on the little Andrea Gale. The last radio transmission of Billy Tyne, the captain of the fishing boat, came at 6 p.m. on October 28, 1991. He reported his coordinates to the captain of his sister ship, the Hannah Bowden, saying, she's coming on, boys, and she's coming on strong. The popular book and the movie brought the term perfect storm into common use. But the concept is as old as humanity. People have always had to deal with the convergence of multiple rough circumstances. Today, in our faster, more crowded, and more complex world, a few little squalls can quickly become the perfect storm. And when multiple conditions converge and threaten critical areas of our lives, 
such as finances, relationships, jobs, and health, we question how much more we can endure. There is really no better term available to describe what we're going through right now. This is the ultimate perfect storm. We are in the midst of this storm, and it's very hard not to feel the clutches of fear that accompany us serious storms. The fate of the Andrea Gale demonstrates two kinds of fear that we all experience. The first is that gut-level adrenaline-drenched fear that the crew felt in the midst of the storm. They were afraid because their lives were on the line. This kind of fear is beneficial. It's, it's a necessary instinct for survival. But there's another kind of fear that can immobilize us completely, and that's the fear of fear itself. Fear in the midst of the storm is instinctive and beneficial. Fear of a storm that could happen is not. It's like the fear educator William Hughes expressed in his poem. Last night I saw upon the stair a little man who wasn't there. He wasn't there again today. Oh, how I wish he'd go away. We need a perspective on life that takes into account the perfect storms but also reassures us that there's a safe harbor within reach. And that's where Jesus Christ comes in. As we follow him, as we, as we become his disciples, our troubles look different in the light of his goodness and his power and his wisdom. What do you do? What, what do we do when the perfect storm comes into our life? How do we manage when the winds of ill fate blow against us? Here from the life of Jesus, is a perfect storm experience that will help us understand how we can deal with the storm we are facing right now. Our lesson begins with the probability of storms in our life, and our passage is in the book of Mark and the fourth chapter. When evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us cross over to the other side. And now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along, in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. Uh, it is evening, and Jesus and his disciples are exhausted after a full day of ministry. Jesus' decision to cross from Capernaum to the other side of the Sea of Galilee is the only way he and his disciples can get away from the crowds. The Gospels tell us that Jesus was near exhaustion, and his 12 disciples were reeling from the rigorous training he'd been giving to them. The crowds had been overwhelming. Sick people, craving his healing touch, had flocked to Jesus on every street. Now Jesus was speaking near the shore of the Sea of Galilee. The crowds had begun to press in so hard that he was almost shoved back into the water, and he climbed into a boat and pushed out a few feet, and he sat down and continued teaching, according to the verse, verse 1 of Mark chapter 4. And by the time he had finished, it was evening. Desperately needing rest, Jesus and the disciples simply remained in the boat and set sail for the eastern shore, where Jesus was to minister the next day. The elements of a perfect storm were gathering. I've been to Israel many times, and I can tell you from my own experience that the Sea of Galilee is like a bowl of water nestled nearly 700 feet below sea level. Mountains surround nearly every side of the sea, forming a valley and gullies that set the stage for howling winds. And when the cool air from the mountains swoops through the valleys and collides with the warm, moist air hovering over the sea, violent storms can erupt in a matter of minutes. And that's just what happened. Mark 4.37 says, A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. The great windstorm, which arose on this particular day, could be described as a furious squall. Mark, in his gospel, uses a Greek word for the windstorm that is often translated hurricane. And Matthew describes the storm as a great seismos, or earthquake, like there was an earthquake in the middle of the lake and the shaking of the winds and, and the boat. This storm was so violent that the waves were breaking over the boat in which Jesus was with his disciples, and it was filling it up with water. And while the boat was filling with water, 
the hearts of the disciples were also filling up with fear. Just as sudden storms are inevitable on the Sea of Galilee, men and women, sudden storms can descend on our lives too. The coronavirus is our sudden storm. One day the sea was calm and we awoke on the next day and we were in the biggest storm any of us have ever experienced. The probability of storms in our lives. Let's notice secondly, the paradox of storms in our lives. Here's an interesting thought from this story. At this time in their lives, the disciples were just following Jesus wherever he went, yet here they are being tossed up and down by a storm and in danger of drowning. They were in the middle of God's perfect will and they were in the middle of a perfect storm all at the same time. They were about to learn a priceless lesson. And that is that storms are not always a punishment for lack of obedience. Sometimes they are the result of obedience. The disciples were not in the storm because they had done something wrong. They were in the storm because they were just doing something right. Those men were there because they had jumped in the boat when Jesus said, let's go. So there's a paradox here. Well, they didn't do anything wrong. They're in the midst of a storm. And some people would say, how does that work? So you see the probability of storms in our lives and the paradox of storms in our lives. Let's notice third, the presence in the storms of our lives. Mark 4.38 says this, but Jesus was in the stern asleep on a pillow and they awoke him and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? The disciples, you see, had yet to learn who Jesus was. If they had realized the full power and authority that Jesus held, they would have laughed and shouted at the wind. In the midst of the storm, there was a presence. Some people believe in the power of God, but they're not sure about the presence of God. This was the crisis the disciples faced. They knew that Jesus was there, but apparently they still didn't realize that he was God. This meant they were unaware of God's presence. So they didn't know what Jesus could and would do. They knew that God could take control over the winds and the seas, but they had not yet come to believe that Jesus was God. Remember, the 12 knew the story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. They knew that God could take control over the winds and the seas, but was that same God with them here and now? That was their question. They did not yet realize that Moses God and their master were one and the same, and they truly had Emmanuel, God with us, in the boat where the storm had captured them. Incidentally, this is the only time in the Bible where we are told that Jesus slept, and he did it in the midst of a fierce storm. So that night on the Sea of Galilee, an exhausted Jesus slept on a cushion in the rear of the boat with the waves crashing all about him and his disciples in despair for their lives. So we have the probability of storms in our lives and the paradox of storms in our lives and the presence in the storms of our lives and now we come to the peace in the storms of our lives. Verse 39 says this, Jesus arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still and the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Mark tells us that Jesus rebuked the wind just as a parent would rebuke an unruly child. He dealt with demons in the same way when he rebuked them. And the wind obeyed him just as the demons did. This incredible display of miraculous power should have quelled any remaining doubts in the minds of the disciples as to who Jesus was. I mean, the Old Testament tells us that only God has power over nature. Psalm 89 verse 9 says, You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. Psalm 107 and verse 29 says, He calms the storm so that its waves are still. And that's what Jesus did in this storm. He, he first brought peace to the circumstances around his disciples before he calmed their hearts. There was a calm around the disciples before there was a stillness inside the disciples. Aren't you thankful for the moments when he stills the storm and chaos around you while your emotions are running high? Our loving Heavenly Father is kind and patient with us when the storms of life overwhelm us 
and fill us with anxiety. We've experienced some of that in recent days. He's gracious to show us his power even when we're beginning to wonder if he's asleep or absent, even when our cries to him for help are permeated with doubt. But we can face whatever circumstances await us with courage if we just reflect on his faithfulness and place our confidence in his great power and loving purpose for our lives. Remember, men and women, that peace is not the absence of stress. Peace is the presence of the Savior. So you have the probability of storms in your life and the paradox of storms in your life and the presence of storms in your life and the peace in the storms in your life. But let's notice number five, the purpose of storms in our lives. And let's ask the question that's in the back of many of our minds. Did Jesus bring about this storm just so he could calm it and build his disciples' faith? No, no, he didn't do that. He had no need to create new storms to demonstrate his true nature because This fallen world stirs up enough storms without him having to do it specially. (laughs) He builds our faith by using the storms that are already there. So I see no reason to believe that Jesus went to sleep for any other purpose than catch some much needed rest. Yet he was quick to use the storm, wasn't he? As a teachable moment. The storm brought him their full attention, even as the coronavirus has brought us to attention. And the lesson would never be forgotten by those disciples as I hope it will not soon be forgotten by us. Since we are human beings, I think I'm safe in saying that we have no shortage of storms in our lives. Not just the storm, the big one that we're going through now, but we live in a fallen world and trouble of some kind is woven into the fabric of life. Until these storms hit, we live with the delusions of adequacy. But storms cut us down to size and cause us to fear what we cannot control. And although God does not create the storm in our life, he uses the churning seas to demonstrate his power and strengthen our faith in him. I'm a real fan of C.S. Lewis. He has a way of saying things that really help me understand. This is what he said. He said, God who has made us knows what we are and that our happiness lies in him. Yet we will not seek it in him as long as he leaves us any other resort where it can even plausibly be looked for. While what we call our own life remains agreeable, we will not surrender it to him. What then can God do in our interest but make our own life less agreeable to us and take away the plausible sources of false happiness? I have to honestly tell you, that what's going on for many of us now is we're sequestered and can't go anywhere and do what we normally do. Uh, We have found our life less agreeable, have we not? But if we pause for a moment and take a step back, if we examine what's really going on, we will discover what David the psalmist discovered, and that's the value of the storms God allows. In Psalm 119 and verse 67, David said it this way, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Once again in Psalm 119, verse 71, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. David said, God used the afflictions, the storms in my life to bring me back to a relationship with him. He said, before this happened, I was going astray. And maybe some of you would have to say the same thing. You know, it's so easy to get comfortable with our faith and then allow our faith to be pushed to the circumference of life. We go on with the busyness of our work and our family and our enjoyments and our sports and all the things that are a part of us. And all of a sudden, the God who desires to be the center of our life is barely on the circumference of our life. And like David, we'll go through something like this. And if we're careful, if we listen to our heart, if we're sensitive to what God is doing, we'll discover what David discovered. Before the storm, we went astray, but now we have come back to fellowship with God. I hope that is true for many of you. I've heard from some of you that that is what's happening. So Jesus allowed the winds to rage in order that his disciples would learn to trust him. And through the storms of life, our Lord teaches us many precious lessons. He reminds us of our own human emptiness, 
our own total dependence upon him. He teaches us to fear God with astonished reverence, not to fear the storms. We're almost finished, but there's still a couple of points left. The probability of storms in our lives. The paradox of storms in our lives. The presence in the storms of our lives. The peace in the storms of our lives. The purpose of storms in our lives and the product of storms in our lives. Once again, Mark chapter four and verse 40. Jesus said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now please notice Jesus was a lot gentler with the disciples than he was with the wind. When he rebuked the wind, he only asked his disciples two questions. Why are you so fearful, and how is it that you have no faith? With these questions, Jesus reveals a spiritual truth, and that is that the opposite of faith is not unbelief. The opposite of faith is fear. Belief breeds confidence, while unbelief breeds fear. Essentially, Jesus was saying, Why are you afraid? Do you not yet trust God whose power is present in me? In the book of 1 Kings tells us about the prophet Elijah who challenged the prophets of Baal to a duel of faith on top of Mount Carmel. From morning until noon, the prophets of Baal called upon their God to send down fire and consume the sacrifice on the altar, but nothing happened, not even a flicker. And Elijah mocked them with stinging sarcasm. In 1 Kings 18, 27, he says this, cry aloud for he is a God. Either he is meditating or he is busy or he's on a journey or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. The disciples apparently assumed that Jesus was just as indifferent to their plight. So they cried, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Elijah's suggestion that Baal might have been asleep is precisely the complaint the disciples leveled at Jesus. You're sleeping and we're drowning. Please, wake up. But there's a specific fear that may be claiming your attention. Whatever that fear is, it will only be amplified by failure to trust in God. He is not sleeping. He is here. He knows every thought in your mind and in mine, every feeling in our hearts. And while I stare with fear at the dark skies, he focuses on the person he is forming me to be. He sees those storms as growing pains, part of the formation process. He knows that a storm may be the very thing that awakens me to deep faith in him. And what really intrigues me about this account is that Jesus replaced the disciples' fear with more fear. After staring in awe at the suddenly calm and windless sea, the Bible says they feared exceedingly. And they said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Several Bible translations say they were terrified they suddenly realized they were in the presence of a power they had never imagined could be in a person. And the power was mightier than the violence of a stormy sea. Matthew tells us that in their awe, they asked, what kind of man is this? Not what kind of God is this? They were still focused on his humanity. And although they were beginning to realize that he was something more than mere flesh and blood, it never entered their heads that Jesus actually created the Sea of Galilee and that the wind and waters were his. The disciples no longer worried about drowning. Now they were in awe of Jesus and they felt a new sense of security in him. Debilitating fears were being replaced with the empowering fear of God, whom they dimly began to realize was with them in the presence of Jesus. The probability of storms, the paradox of storms, the presence of the storms, the peace in the storm, the purpose of the storm, the product of the storm, and the promises for the storms in our lives. As we review this story, which is familiar to most of us if we're readers of the Bible, we know the story. We know the story of Jesus sleeping in the back of the boat. But here are some takeaways from this story that are meant to help you and me as we negotiate our stormy time right now. First of all, God's word alerts us to expect stormy seas. 
Men and women, the New Testament is salted with warnings about the stormy seas we face as followers of Jesus Christ. James writes in his book, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Peter writes in his book, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Jesus gave us the key to surviving storms in his story about two houses. Do you remember that? One built on the sand and the other on the rock. The sand represents the shallow, shifting, and unreliable values of worldly culture, and the rock represents the unshakable truth of God. As the storm rages, the first house quickly topples into the sand and washes out to sea, and the other stands firm, withstanding the force of the most violent winds. In decades of ministry, I have often seen the truth of this parable vividly demonstrated. People who place their trust in God withstand every storm because they have built their lives on the only foundation that cannot be moved. And people who do not do that crumble when the storms come. Let me just tell you, you shouldn't be surprised when storms come into your life because God told us it would happen. His word alerts us to expect stormy seas. Secondly, God's word announces that the Savior is on board. The disciples were too inexperienced with Jesus to have a faith devoid of fear. Perhaps you're the same way. You identify with Christ, but you draw no assurance as the clouds roll in and as the storm, the coronavirus storm continues. When the sky darkens, you might wonder whether you should step into the boat with Jesus or stay ashore in hopes of avoiding the storm. The problem with that choice is that it's a false one. You can't run, you can't hide, The storms will find you. You don't get to decide whether the rain is coming. You only get to decide whether to carry an umbrella. But he is sleeping, you say. He doesn't care. Don't let his seeming silence lead you to conclude that he isn't with you. Jesus says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And in Matthew 28, he says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Those are promises, and he has yet to break a promise. That he will be with you is the most certain fact of your life. What's uncertain is your grasp of that fact and your ability to trust and build your house upon that truth. It's the only storm-proof foundation in existence. And sometimes the rains will pound hard to drown out all other voices, and we struggle to hear Christ But that doesn't mean he isn't calming the storm. The storms pass as they did for these two Christians and we hear the voice of God once again, this time through, a new wisdom tempered by our struggles. And we realize that he was there all the time. God's word alerts us to expect stormy seas. God's word announces that the Savior is on board. And God's word affirms that faith drives out fear. When the terrified disciples awoke Jesus in the midst of the storm, he asked two critical questions. He said, why are you so fearful? And how is it that you have no faith? And when the disciples stepped into the boat, they didn't trust in Jesus so that their fear escalated to terror when the storm came. But when Jesus awoke and calmed the storm, the dawning realization of who he really was ratcheted their faith to a whole new level. Later we learned that they became utterly fearless, proclaiming the truth of the kingdom in the face of all kinds of storms. Had they possessed mature faith that day in the boat, they could have curled up and napped with Jesus with no regard of the storm raging about them. They needed to understand that fear is dispelled only by faith. And then God's word alerts us to expect storms. God's word announces that the Savior's on board. And God's word affirms that faith drives out fear. And number four, God's word assures us of a safe landing. Notice what Jesus said to the disciples as they began their journey. In Mark 4.35, he said, On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now consider what the text says about the end of the journey. Mark chapter 5 and verse 1 says, 
And they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. God's word assures us of a safe landing. We will make it to the other side. Jesus had said, let us cross over to the other side. And Jesus names a destination. It was certain they would reach it. Could there be a storm? Certainly. Would it be comfortable always on the voyage? No assurance of that. The disciples could have worried about ceasingness, but they didn't need to worry about drowning because Jesus had told them where they were going. Will there be storms along the journey? Certainly. Will our voyage be comfortable? We're learning right now that it's not comfortable all the time. No assurance that we will ever have a completely comfortable life. We might have to worry about seasickness, but what I'm here to tell you is you don't need to worry about drowning. We will get through the storms in our lives and we will arrive where Jesus is taking us. Let me say it again. If Jesus says we're going to the other side, we're going to the other side. Our Lord is with us and we will not be abandoned by him in our time of need. So as we wrap all of this up, here is the key question that I alluded to at the beginning. Is Jesus in your boat? (laughs) Or better yet, is Jesus in your heart and in your life? The disciples wouldn't have made it without the presence of Jesus, and I'm pretty convinced that we're not gonna make it, you're not gonna make it with victory without Jesus in your life. The storm was meant to get your attention. This storm we're in was meant to help you understand how desperately you need God because only God is is worthy of trust in such an untrust time. So let me ask you again, is, is Jesus in your boat? Is he in your heart? Have you ever accepted him as your personal savior? And I want to ask you right now to do that if you've never done it before. I want to ask you to invite Jesus Christ into your life, into your storms, into the troubles that you are going through right now, into all of your questions and wondering about jobs and money and and food and all of the rest of it. Invite Jesus Christ into the middle of it. Invite him into your heart. And here's how you do that. You pray a prayer, and through that prayer, you make that invitation. So let me lead you in that prayer. Let me help you pray that prayer. Pray this prayer after me. Dear God, I need your presence in my life. I need your son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior and Lord. In the midst of all of this confusion, in the midst of the fear, in the midst of the wondering about the future, at this moment in time in my life, I invite Jesus Christ to be the captain of my soul. I invite him to come into my life and take his position on the throne of my life. Be my Lord and Savior. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Make me a new person. Make me a new creature. Forgive me of my sin. And I will seek to serve you going forward. And Father, I want to thank you that wherever that prayer is prayed, you have heard it and answered it. Because in your book you say you're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Thank you for those who prayed this prayer. Give them the courage to follow through on what they have done. That this won't be a whim or a moment or an emotional response, but a deep-seated decision that will change their lives forever. And we'll give you the praise for what you're going to do in each heart today. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And if you made that decision to put your trust in Christ, for many of you, as you're watching uh, on the internet, uh, on your computer, there's a place on the screen where you can check that you have made the decision to put your trust in Christ. Please check that. And if you will give us information, we will send you some material that will help you grow. We have a little booklet called Your Greatest Turning Point that outlines some steps that you can take that will help you grow in your relationship with Christ. The booklet is absolutely free, and all you have to do is ask for it, and we'll send it to you. My prayer is for you that you will trust in God in the midst of this storm and find what we always find, that he is sufficient, that he loves us, and he loves us with an incredible love, and he will see us through. Men and women, we're going to get through this storm. We'll get through it together together. 